Hello everyone, this is Araceli Garcia, your ELA TOSA for 6th to 12th grade classes. This is a little short video review of a writing PD that I did for many of the schools. So I wanted to just go ahead and cover some of the main points that we went through. All right, so just a little bit about me, uh, a little bit about what we covered. So we did discuss some research and data. We did talk in length about the challenges that we're facing today with our students and lots and lots of strategies. Uh, on this PowerPoint, you will see a lot of hyperlinks that you can explore on your own. All right, here's a little bit about me. and You can definitely read this on your own. But again, I've been in this district for many years, uh, for, served in different uh, capacities, including uh, as ELA teacher for many, many years at my alma mater, Workman High School, and also served at Wilson High School for about five years. Uh, and again, I've taken a lot of my experiences in working with students of all levels and interest and apply them now to this new position as your ELA TOSA. Uh, one of the things I do want to mention is besides working with ELA programs, uh, I also do literacy across the curriculum. And I have also served as a, a facilitator and a consultant for UCLA Center X uh, for the design-based learning program. So if you're interested in getting students off of the computer and interacting, uh, then please, you know, you can schedule a, a meeting with me and I could show you and talk to you about using hands-on project, very similar to project-based, uh, and with simple household items where students would make their own designs and then be able to talk about it, uh, interview other students about it, and write about it. And so I can show you how you can integrate a design-based learning method into your classroom. All right, well, let's jump right in. Okay, so I always like to use Pear Deck uh, as a way to present information to both my students and to participants in any of my workshops. And the reason I like to use Pear Deck is because, again, of the interactive nature. So this is one slide I like to use with my students. Uh, I have taught ELD classes, including ELD for newcomers. And what this allows me to do is to create a safe space for them to interact with one another. So a simple question, you can always change the prompt, change, uh, again, you can add different features. Uh, there's a lot of Pear Deck activities, um, templates that you can already use and make them into your own. So here, for example, we would have a little discussion. I would share what other students have answered. This takes about a five minute, again, kind of settles in the class and lets them know from the get-go that this is an interactive class that discussion and using their speaking and listening skills is going to be required of them at all times. All right, so I just want to show that. Here's another slide that I like to use. I use this kind of like a Pictionary game with my students. And yes, even at the high school level, we need to have a little bit of fun, settle them in, uh, get them again, maybe some think pair share activity. So I always ask them maybe to draw something. So Pear Deck allows them to draw. And then I show, share with the class some of the drawings that students did. And it's a great class building activity. Again, you're building rapport, uh, you're uh, lowering that effective filter because writing is very vulnerable. Um, and students don't want to be wrong or feel like their peers are going to make fun of them. And so what you're doing here is just establishing that, that type of safe environment. All right, what else do we have? So let's talk about some data. So if you look at the CAF scores and notice the year, this is prior to the pandemic where we actually had the full length test. Now it's been modified, so it's hard to kind of, uh, you know, compare the two, but I, we will. And so what you'll see here is here's the state of California. Take a look. Even before the pandemic hit, we were not in a good place. Only not even half of our students in the state were reading and writing at proficiency level. Take a look at Hacienda La Puente, uh, not right, far better. And so we knew already that students were struggling in this area. So the mentality that we need to go back to the basics, go back to how things were is, is uh, again, a misconception because things were not that great back then. So our students already needed something and the pandemic and distance learning only exacerbated the issues that they were facing. And so let's keep going. But what happened after the pandemic? Well, as you could have guessed, and I always tell teachers, I probably don't need to show you the data because you can see it in your classroom, is that our students, again, um, you know, are, are not meeting. There they're, you have large gaps. Sometimes in one classroom, you have a variety, a larger gap between students who are doing well versus students 
who are not. So take a look, here is our district where we are at with this. Now, another set of data that you can use is, of course, your SMAP. So if you go to growth reports and you look for this one, this is your growth summary quadrant, you can, uh, you know, again, choose which area you want to look at. So notice how I clicked on only reading. So these are only reading. And if this was a live page, you could actually click on each of these and see the student names. Um, and if you scroll down, you actually get the entire list. And just to go over this, this quadrant, this is a comparison of how students did last year, fall 2022, with how they scored this year on fall 2023. So that's a pretty large uh, amount of time. So what we'll see here is, this is your kiddos that are, that, you know, are doing great. I would definitely meet with them and say, good job, keep doing, take a look at, you know, show them how they did. Um, because these are your high achieving students who also had a high growth between fall 22 and fall 23. Now these kids also, and in fact, I would celebrate all of these kids for trying, but also I would talk to these students and say, wow, look at you, look at this kid here. They are kids who are low achieving, maybe not at the proficiency level, but they, their growth was tremendous. Take a look, that kid right here, definitely, I would talk to him like, wow, way to go. What a big difference you're making. You're on the right track. Now let's talk about these kiddos down here. Now these kids, uh, we're a bit concerned with, right? Maybe these are kids um, who didn't see the purpose or the point of this assessment or something else was going on because these are the kids who are capable, right? They have high achievement scores uh, from the first, from the fall, but they either did not grow or they actually uh, decreased in their uh, growth, right? So maybe we need to talk to them and find out, you know, what's going on. Maybe they had a bad day. Um, maybe again, like I said, they didn't know what the purpose was. And if teachers do not discuss test scores uh, with their students, what we tend to see is a decline in test scores, again, because they feel like it's just a little a task that doesn't matter to them or their grade. Now, these kiddos here, especially these down here, these are kiddos that again, have low achievement in their, well, in this case, their reading skills, and also showed very little growth or negative, right? Uh, they went down on their score. So again, uh, is this an issue of motivation? Have they lost engagement in school? Um, or do they have some serious reading deficiencies? So these are the students that you might want to look at for intervention. All right, so there we have some data. So of course, like we said, we know the students are struggling and and again i could show you the numbers but a lot of times we also see it in their own behavior i'm just going to go ahead and read this out it says i don't know of a single school leader who doesn't think that kids came back from the pandemic different they appear to have shorter attention spans they struggle in social interactions with peers they have more behavioral issues and they struggle to persist with tasks when i'm doing this presentation in person i just have the teachers nodding a uh, very right? Uh, a strong yes to this. This is what they're noticing, a lot of apathy, even with some of the top students. And so the question is, why? Why are students struggling not only to write, but just across the board? And this is not just the Hacienda La Puente issue. I'm telling you, this is across the nation. Uh, just this summer, I went to Illinois, and I was working with the teachers in an urban uh, school setting. And uh, it was it was the same complaint. Kids, uh, are not engaged, uh, they are not doing their work, they're not willing to try, they wait for the teacher to give the answer, right? Um, and so how do we motivate our students to believe that there is a good future in education? All right, so during uh, the live presentation, I would have uh, everyone share out and talk about, you know, why do you think some students are struggling uh, with writing? And, and so you can kind of think that through. Well, one of the things that a lot of teachers have said is students are afraid to be wrong. They are afraid to take that risk. Uh, they don't trust their, their skills, their writing skills. Along the way, they got the feeling that they weren't doing it right, whether it was uh, created by the a classroom environment, a teacher. Sometimes we as teachers, you know, might, um, you know, uh, stunt the growth of a student if we're constantly looking at all just the things where they went wrong rather than celebrating growth. So what is it that we need to look at? All right, one of the graphics I love to use, and you can pause it here to read this on your own, but I'm just gonna go over it very quickly, is to understand who is sitting in our classroom. It is important to know that the students of today are different from the students of just 
three, four years ago. And they're definitely different from when we were students. And as I always like to say, you know, we're not trying to pull them back into the past, right? Whenever I get into this mode of back in my day, kids used to play outside. Yeah, I know, back in my day. However, my job is to try to push them forward into the future, not bring them back uh, as, as much as I like to romanticize the past. So one of the things I need to understand is that our students are social, for most part, now of course not all, but take a look at this number. 7.6 hours per day socializing with friends. Even playing video games is a social activity where kids can put on headsets and interact with others. Um, constantly texting and, and putting up videos, right? So again, that back and forth interaction. The multitaskers, take a look at this. Five screens at once. Uh, as I always like to say during my presentations, when I sit down and watch a movie, I sit down and watch a movie. That's the one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to drown myself in that movie. However, our young people tend to have the television on, their cell phone by the side, maybe even a laptop, maybe, right? They're switching back and forth. And so that, again, is it the best way to, to live, especially if you're trying to do homework? No, but this is the world that they are immersed in. So how can I use that to figure out how to write my lessons. So knowing that they're multitaskers, knowing that they are interactive, that they're na uh, digital natives, they grew up you know, with cell phones in their hand. And as I like to point out, the children didn't buy their cell phones, right? We as adults, as parents a lot of times, have given them this device. And yes, there's now some kind of an addiction to this device. And because of that, they have become less focused. But they are tech savvy and they can figure things out. And here's some of the assets. They are entrepreneurs. They're seeing that they have value in their own talents uh, that they can maybe uh, market. So let's bring those kind of skills in and, and talk to them about the skills of being a YouTube influencer, of being a blogger, right? I'm having, uh, you know, of being a makeup artist or a cook. And so again, we want to tap into their interests. Here's another thing. They're educated in the things they love. They could go down a rabbit hole uh, about bumblebees or about aliens. So let's create spaces in our classroom to have them share what they already know, what they're finding out. Philanthropists, they're very aware about the world outside. And some of them are very passionate about it. So again, how can we create uh, spaces for them to share or to learn more about these type of interests? And finally, cautious. Many teachers have shared students are afraid to take risks. Um, and here's the thing, especially for high school uh, students, when we as teachers constantly talk about the future, and this is to prepare them for the future and for college, many of our students are skeptical about what that future is. They might not trust adults in their life because of what they've seen. They might not trust that the future is secure. So how can we make this moment in our classrooms valuable for them and make it relevant to their lives so that they see what they can do with their education. All right, well, let's move on to actual curriculum. So whatever you're using, whether it's Study Sync or Impact or any of these other uh, programs, one of the things that we're hearing is that students are bored. Well, I'm gonna show you what you can do to maybe enliven your lessons and, and change them up just slightly so the students are more engaged. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but I wanted to show teachers just the type of genres that students are expected to write, especially at the high school level. So I'm just gonna kind of go through there. And here's the basic outlines, as you'll see, uh, we'll come back to writing frame. Again, some literary analysis, uh, some informative writing, and some narrative writing. Okay. And again, lots of kind of the, the same formula is going to ask for intro paragraph, it's going to ask for body paragraphs and so forth. Now, knowing that our students need to get through these writing tasks, but at the same time are not motivated, the question is, what does motivate students to write? So I'm just going to highlight here a couple of points. It says in our focus group, teens said they are motivated to write when they can select topics that are relevant to their lives and interests and report greater enjoyment of school writing when they have the opportunity to write creatively. Having teachers or other adults who challenge them, present them with interesting curricula, and give them detailed feedback also serves as motivators for teens. 
Teens also report writing for an audience. An authentic audience motivates them to write and write well. So I want you to keep this in mind as I show you some of the things that you can do in your classes to get your students writing and enjoying the process of writing. Okay, so let's try these ideas. So here what you'll see is the traditional study sync prompt. I want you to look at, this is for grade six, right? It, it says they have been reading a lot of informative short excerpts and articles. Now their job is to explain how three individuals in three of the excerpts have faced life challenging experiences and analyze the impact of these challenges, changes in their lives and their countries. Again, for a sixth grader who's had possible um, learning gaps, who is coming in not very motivated and without the traction to persevere through a task like this, this might be very challenging. So what can we do with this? Let's take a look here and I'm gonna call this deeper learning lessons. It's part of our philosophy, right? Our, our uh, initiative here at our school district, uh, deeper learning. Look how I just changed it slightly. I said, there are many life-changing experiences in a video or uh, interview a friend or a family member who has faced a life-changing experience. In what ways was the experience positive? In what ways was it negative? And what did they learn from themselves? So all of a sudden, we're making this prompt into something that's relevant to their lives. Well, let me show you an example of what one teacher did with this. So this is a classroom here at Nelson, sixth graders, and these students got to choose a person in their lives, and oh my goodness, if you were to hear, you could actually click down here and hear some of these interviews, they were so powerful. These kids were so professional in their tone. They worked on writing their script, thinking about what questions they might like, they interviewed some of their uh, parents, grandparents. Uh, they are, their interview was in Spanish and other languages. And these uh, family members shared things such as dealing with COVID, uh, getting through uh, battling cancer, moving to a new country. Uh, it was so memorable and so po uh, powerful that the teacher told me just uh, a year later that these kids talked about this project the entire year. They were so proud of the work that they had done. And again, you can watch these on your own. All right, here's another one. This is for grade seven. This one says, think about characters you read in the selections. Write an informative, explanatory essay that answers this question, modeling elements of your writing on the student model, right? So they're basically going to write about characters and what motivated them. Again, this is not very connected to their own lives. So take a look at what you can do to change it. Research a person you admire or a family member who has taken on an incredible mission. So again, giving students some choice, giving students the opportunity to connect to people in their own lives. They might go and re uh, talk to a friend, maybe who's dealt with something difficult, maybe another teacher on campus, maybe a family member right? Or a famous athlete or artist. All of a sudden, yes, they're going to want to do those assignments. But take a look how I also changed what they're producing. I'm still going to teach the skills of writing, how to write a topic sentence, how to write a thesis. That is not going away, but it's the product that's going to drive the interest for my students. So maybe they write an informative blog, and I'll show you how you can write, have students do blogs. Maybe they work with a team and create a newsletter of people who have taken on challenges. Maybe I do a video interview, or maybe I sit around with a video camera and do a podcast. Lots of our students love listening to a crime type of podcast, especially our older kids. All right, again, here's an example of what our students are doing. This was a fifth grade class at Los Altos Elementary School, who, who actually they won a history day competition in California for their podcast on the East LA walkouts. Again, student-centered, they had to come up with their own script, they had to practice and practice over and over for their recordings. Here's another one, this group is from La Puente High School and they created a, um, a serial series, right? A podcast series called Bowl of Serial based on serial killers, including the Black Dahlia, and so forth. They got a chance to choose their topics, uh, create their script, 
interview people, um, everything from the behind the scenes setup to the actual marketing of their podcast. Unbelievable. That's what we want our students to be able to do. Meaningful work. All right. And again, you can watch those videos on your own. And here's another one. And this is the last one. This is for grade eight. Again, this might seem like a great prompt. If you take a look at it, it's talk about suspense. They've been reading some stories about, uh, uh, you know, stories about suspenseful events. And now this one's saying, write your own suspenseful narrative based on real or imagined experiences. As, as many might find like, okay, this seems like a fun activity. However, our students struggle with imagination. And I do believe Google and YouTube has stunted that type of growth. Many of our students struggle to come up with their own original ideas. And so we need to help them out. And so take a look at what we can do here. It says work with a team to create a small community using Jamboard. Then think of what would make your community special. Then pretend that animals and humans have gone missing. Write a short suspense story yeah, in a collaborative way. And your product can be a zine. I'll show you what that is or a graphic novel using Google Slides. All right, well, let's see what that looks like. Take a look here. These are all things my students have done. So here, my students read the monkey's paw, but how to give it an alternative ending. These are my ELD students, my newcomer students, and they were able to use some translation tools. And so uh, I'll show you that in a moment, uh, what this Google Slide looks like. Here's another one. This is the Jamboard City. So using Jamboard, Students can collaborate. I can have four or five students working on creating a city. Where would you put your housing? Where would you put a rec center? What makes your city unique? So first they would create a setting, maybe even come up with some characters, and then I would give them the challenge of writing a suspense story. So now I have built into my classroom prior knowledge. Uh, finally, zines if you don't know what a zine is i highly highly recommend that you look it up the reason is this is a one page mini magazine and students can create their own it's just using one sheet of paper and it is amazing in fact let me show you what that looks like very quickly Right, so as you can see from that video, it is a simple uh, yet highly engaging activity for your students to create their own mini books. And as the video said, they can then have a little sale, if you will, or a little trade post where they can trade uh, zines with each other. Again, think about writing a summary. Why does it always have to be on a Google Docs? Why does it always have to be a traditional journal? Why not add this element of creativity? Let me show you another one. This is again, uh, the monkey's paw graphic novel. And so here's some of my students. Again, I gave them a general idea. They got to choose their pictures. Uh, they, I'm still giving them the writing frames. I'm still giving them some sentence starters that they can use. So again, that's like a little graphic novel. And finally, let me show you here. This is using Jamboard. This is what one group of my students did. Notice they labeled uh, who's in charge of what. Uh, here's another one. Uh, they decided to put uh, their housing in the center, right? Uh, the type of recreation. So again, uh, they got to look at futuristic ideas. Uh, 
I like how it says to, they want to split up the school, uh, boys go on one side and the girls go on the other side. Uh, again, organic conversations, working with other students, coming up with ideas. And then I like to use this idea of a city, making a city uh, with Jamboard to get into books such as The Giver, Lord of the Flies, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, basically any story because they all have setting. And so these are just some of the ideas that you can use. Let me keep going here. All right, so um, how can you make your lessons and activities more meaningful, engaging? Think about, again, our elements for NPDL. How can I uh, have them be more creative? How can I have them collaborate with other students? How can I have them go beyond the walls of my classroom and take it out into the community, into their homes? Um, how can I make it meaningful and real world? Uh, experiences. All right. What? What about structure? It can always be fun and games. Okay. So what about writing? So uh, again, some of the main things I want to keep emphasizing is that even though students are doing things like blogs and newsletters and graphic uh, novels or children's books, you're still teaching the skills of writing, clarity, coherence, logical sequencing. And so one of the methods that works best is using very structured writing at the beginning. So again, I like to look at the trajectory, something like this. Well, first of all, a lot of hand holding, a lot of um, writing frames and sentence starters, right? And so I would, I do suggest that teachers maybe ch choose a model. I don't like using the Jane Schaefer model. It's very simple, uh, just to give students kind of those training wheels. But then they have to start releasing. You have to start letting them go, maybe by using some mentor text, maybe by having them work with peers in a collaborative way. Nothing wrong with students doing group essays, especially if you have a very big class, um, partner work and so forth. And then you wanna get them to fly, to do things on their own, to take risks. And the way they do that is by looking at what other strong writers have done, a mentor text. So if I want them to write a powerful personal statement for let's say uh, college applications, have them read strong personal statements and have them analyze what did the author do well? Um, how did they shift? What are some patterns that the author is using? All right, uh, here you'll get again some uh, writing frames and these are speaking frames. So you don't want them uh, just going on to, to the writing frames when they're writing a formal essay, but even in discussion, when you're having a Socratic seminar, when you're having a debate, have students look at, use some of this language. Um, and so, you know, sometimes they get a little bit too robotic uh, and, and continue to say the same sentence. Uh, uh, I hear your point, however, right? But it's a good practice for them and it starts to become more natural. Uh, here's again, another writing frame. This is on a Google Doc and I'm going to go ahead and uh, give that to you. It's also something that you'll see in the They Say, I Say book, which is often used at the colleges. And again, here's another writing frame. So all of these hyperlinks that you can look at. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, here's one that I created for you to turn into a Pear Deck uh, slide opportunity, because again, I, I highly recommend that you use Pear Deck. And I'll, uh, again, I'll be talking to you about why I like using Pear Deck, but this gives uh, students an opportunity to go slide by slide uh, practicing how to write a formal essay. All right, why do I like Pear Deck? The reason is, because when students are responding on this platform, I have my dashboard and I can see how each student is doing. If I scroll down below, it'll also show me students who have not responded. So I can then walk over to the student and offer my support and my help, especially for your English learners, especially for your students with special needs. I can see on the spot in a real time their progress. I don't have to wait until they submit that essay or I get those papers back, right? I can do it on the spot in class. So I'm not taking all of this work home and then realizing they didn't understand the lesson. I could do it in, in that moment. Again, I have even had students do uh, maybe some calibrating, looking at a sample essay and looking to see, okay, what is the student doing well? With Pear Deck, they're able to highlight and circle. I might have them do this with a small group or with the partner. Again, lots of different activities I can use. Does it always have to be an essay? No, again, I've talked about this before. Here's some programs that you can use. So uh, here's some sample 
uh, writings that I had uh, some students do. This was an eighth grade class. They had to write a full page, but they just wrote maybe one or two sentences based on a video they had seen. And so as you can see, students, you know, had some struggles, right? Well, by the end of a two week little workshop, working a lot on, on just basically the same type of format uh, using the frames, my students ended up doing a newsletter and I put all their newsletters or their blogs, if you wanna call them blogs, on a Padlet. So let me show you what that looks like. So this was a group of eighth graders uh, and what they did is they got to choose a issue that had to do with social media, right? Should adults be able to, to see what children are doing on social media, such as on TikTok and Instagram? Should parents have access? And of course, the students love this topic. And so we talked about uh, limiting free speech. And so here you'll see what students wrote about. So this is that program Sway is through Microsoft Office, extremely easy for them to use. Um, and it gets them again interested in in uh, creating their own uh, images and so forth oops let me see if i can get to them all right and so what the students got to create let's see if this opens up there it goes it's a very professional looking um engaging product that they create again because this program uses some ai it gives them access to uh, all the images that they might want to choose from. So it's a one-stop shop for, for them. So take a look at this. This is, again, eighth grade student who was struggling with some uh, writing skills. Take a look at what this looks like, right? And notice, again, if you stop and read this, you'll see those elements of that writing frame. The hook, the background sentence, the thesis, three-part thesis, the body paragraph with topic sentences. Uh, they have some evidence here. They cited their evidence and so forth and then they're able to add other elements to it. So again, changing up a little bit of that product will motivate your students to do some of these assignments, of course, with lots of scaffolding. Finally, I give you this link here where you can take a look at uh, examples of micro, micro mentor texts. Uh, and we do have a book here. I am looking to see if any teachers are interested and we can order some for you if you're interested in using this method. Uh, and I end with letting you know that there, we have other upcoming PDs. If you're, wel you're welcome to join me, any teacher, any content, any grade is welcome. It's not just for ELA teachers. My next one will be uh, today, actually, uh, the 13th of September, if you're interested. And I'll go over more on Pear Deck and Sway. We also have an in-person PD coming up on design-based learning. So if you want to get students to work on project base uh, in your classes and tie it into your curriculum. You can join us for that. That'll be at Newton Middle School. And then you could take a look at these other ones that you can attend. Uh, also, uh, I do have, I constantly update our ELA uh, Canvas page. So if you go to Canvas, our curriculum instruction and assessment site, you'll find lots of resources there. And look out for the monthly newsletter where I highlight lots and lots of student-centered lessons and great activities that our teachers are doing. So I thank you so much for your time. Here is my contact information, including uh, following me on Instagram on my teacher site here where you'll find more resources, uh, looking at some YouTube videos that I have created, or if you're interested in design-based learning, taking a look at what we offer through UCLA Center X. I thank you for your time and energy and good luck with everything that you do. Goodbye.